Hi, this is Father Dennis Rand, pastor at St. Dominic Parish, sort of with our third in a series that we're going to talk about mental health. In the first one, we talked more about just in general. Uh, we talked about it in adults, and the last one we had, we talked about young adults more specifically. And now we'd like to talk a little bit about children and what parents can do to help children during this pandemic time. Um, with me again is, is Dr. Lynn Cano. Kondo Block Fetters, thank you, who's a clinical psychologist and also is on the faculty at Marquette University. And so thank you again for joining us. I know we're keeping you here for a long time on purpose because you're really helpful for what we're doing. Um, a lot of questions that when we started to talk about this had to do and actually came from the school. Um, and a lot of the school parents were asking what impact first does this have for us, we're adults, we kind of understand why we're doing this, what we're doing, and although it's hard for us, we can rationalize it, and it rationalization helps us to cope. Kids, this is like, what's going on? So the first question I do, what is your sense of impact that this may have on school-age children, even younger kids? Kids are so resilient that they might look like they're struggling in the moment, but kids um, have a way of overcoming such strong challenges um, because they're young and they're flexible and they are uh, resilient. So I would encourage parents not to take the attitude of this is going to be such a difficult circumstance and my child's never going to survive it and they're going to be formed for life because of this. Um, but really encourage your children to be healthy and strong and show that you are healthy and strong. And kids are adaptable, they'll survive. Is that what they call projection? <laughs> In psychological terms where I project what I'm going through, you must be going through it too. Well, but kids take their emotional cues from their parents. Mm -hmm. So if you as a parent are worried and afraid and sad and irritable, your kids are going to read those cues and have that be shaped in their experience. And you know, I have to say that some of the parishioners that are I have spoken with, that's exactly where they are. They're so terrified of both being exposed to COVID, getting COVID from what they hear, that I'm sure their poor little kids are living in terror as well from what they're doing. So I, that's a really good message that I hear. Um, how do you address some of the circumstances that we've had. You can't see grandma. You, you can't, we can't have Thanksgiving. Um, how do you address those with the kids? What do you do with kids that are used to? This is what, I don't understand. This was what we did and how come we can't do it now? So it is heartbreaking for kids and parents alike. And so the first thing is to just acknowledge that. I know it's sad that you want to see your friends or you want to see grandma and we can't this year and I'm sad about that too and really modeling for your child let's put a name on those feelings um, and don't rush them through that um, when when we have to tell our children we can't go to this you know sometimes we get t tears right um, and you don't want to just say just stop crying and you know you, you want to just let them have their feelings and say yeah this is hard we're all struggling with this this is a big deal um, but on the other hand then you want to gently remind them this is what we're doing this for this is why we're trying to keep grandma safe or this is why we said no to going to this party because we're all trying to do our best right now in a really hard situation and kids get that mm -hmm. they'll they'll emerge from their disappointment with um, some sense that there's we're not just doing this to be mean or wrong or you know cause you pain but to really be safe and prudent and it might be an opportunity to do something different we can't see grandma's but let's make it, each make an ornament for her or do something that you never thought of or things that you did when you were a kid um, that you gave up on because your kids are more sophisticated now and they'll do the 3D projector, it'll make the 3D image and then they'll put it on the 3D printer. Here, I made an ornament for my grandma um, instead of making things out of toothpicks and stuff that we did. Um, but I think that one of the things that they could do is to do something like that for their even their friends 
you know, they, they're not going to be able to see their friends, but let's make ornaments for that they remember us mm -hmm. or do something. It may also be a nice opportunity for them to, again, give of themselves. Maybe they never thought of, can we give a toy to somebody? Let's do something for somebody else. Maybe a good opportunity to bring that kind of help your neighbor attitude in there. Absolutely. Our kids have experienced other children in quarantine and unexpectedly. And so um, my husband brought our kids um, to the store. They went to Target. They picked out a few little nice snacks and gifts and they left it on the doorstep as a way of saying, hey, we're with you. Even though you can't come out of the house, um, we're here and we care and we love you. And I think just having kids have that experience of reaching out to other kids and, and neighbors and friends and family is really important. And now, during this time, we've got a million opportunities to help kids help other people. And I think they're very creative. So even just, what do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. They'll come up with something much better than you ever thought of exactly. for what to do or so what it is. Uh, one of the things I want to go back and just emphasize again, really in parents, for parents to take care of themselves and to be real about what's going on. You know, we had talked before this about the parents and how different somebody could be working full time. Their kids are somewhat in school, but we're not sure if every day they're going to be in school. They come home, it's dark. Um, they, nobody's made dinner. <laughs> and, we've, and we're sitting there, we're, we're struggling with the normal things. But now we got all these added burdens on top of it. And how important it is for parents to take their own pulse. You know, one of the things we always talked about with, when you go to an emergency, the first thing you do is take your own pulse <laughs> for what you're doing. Just make sure that you're okay because you're not going to be help to anybody if you're not okay with what you're doing. So take a true accounting of that. Is that important? Yes. And I think that, you know, when you get on a flight and they always say, when the mask comes down, put on your own mask before you help someone else. And I never really understood that. But you know, if you're struggling for oxygen, you can't help anyone else. And so it really is important. You know, parents sometimes think, I just need to give to my kids and give and give and give. But kids need you to be healthy. And so sometimes to say to kids, I can't help you right now. I need five minutes. I'm going to go outside for a walk or just I need a moment of peace. Um, but when I come back, I will help you. Um, that's really a good role modeling to show children that you're going to be there and you're going to come back and you're going to help them, but you need a minute first. And a good time to bring faith into the mix to tell your kids, let's pray for this. Let's pray for that. Even, like I said, the church is, hey, they wanna, I want to toot my own horn, but the church is open. So you can say, let's go for a walk and let's stop at church. Just and Let's just spend five minutes and let's just sit. And you can pray for your friend. You can do something for your friend. Think of somebody that needs your prayers. To interject that how important our faith is, and as we talked about in our first conversation, they always have that one eye in heaven that we, we see the beauty of life and point that out to the kids. Look how beautiful the stars look. Look how beautiful the sun rises today or sunset. Look how beautiful taking some time to notice not just like an ant farm where we're all just doing our little work. And engaging kids in their own compassionate, joyful activities is important. I mean, if like we had our kids outside putting up Christmas lights and they said, oh, what are we doing this for? And we said, well, we're doing this because it's going to be dark, but we want everyone who drives by our street to know that, you know, we're bringing a little bit of light into the darkness. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that'll be good. So I, I think helping kids um, do things that are filled with joy and caring for other people, but also articulating, this is why we're doing this, mm -hmm. because we're, we're giving of ourselves because we have so much. And kids are so much more expressive non-verbally than we are. I mean, I, I remember dealing with a lot of parents that were taught to raise their kids, you know, sit your child down, tell them why this was wrong, tell them what you want to do. And it's like having a conversation with them instead of just other things. And now we see kids in artwork, in the way they express themselves. We can really pick up if they're doing well and if they're not doing well. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about what signs, what I should watch out if my child is struggling. What do I look for? What do I notice? What do I see? 
Well, sometimes it's as easy as understanding that they're regressing a little bit in the things that they were doing. So maybe they're potty trained, but they're starting to have accidents or um, they are suddenly not sleeping well, waking up during the night, having nightmares or fears. Um, they could be um, irritable, kind of clingy, needy in some ways. Um, they could be expressing a lot of either sadness or fear, like they don't want parents to leave them or um, they kind of suddenly have developed some fears that just seem to have come out of nowhere. Um, and you can get an emotional read on your child by just watching, is this how they normally are or um, is this different for them? And so being on the watch for difference. And, and one of the things you mentioned was sort of separation. How do they handle separation? And especially in light of what's going on, like you said, are they more clingy? Are they want to know where you're going? When are you coming back? I don't want you to go, Mom. I don't want you to go, Dad. I don't want you to go to work. I don't want... It, it, those often underlie, not that I'm not giving enough attention, but they're underlying because at, at certain ages, kids are struggling with death, I hate to say it, but they're struggling with loss. And if they can't see their grandparent, they're wondering, are you next? <laughs> Am I going to take you away? Are they going to take you away? We're going to have to look at you in a window? Because kids, they, they take what, no matter what we tell them, they have these images of what's going on. And again, the worst thing that could happen is my family gets disrupted. Mm -hmm. And even though we convince, convince them, some of the signs may be that we're starting to see those concerns being raised, like, Mom, are they gonna come and take you, or, <laughs> or just things like that. Mm -hmm. And some, I always talk, when I was a pediatrician, I talked to parents about, listen for really important questions that don't sound really important, and make you stop in your tracks, instead of saying, oh no, honey, that won't happen to me. Stop say, honey, is that what you're thinking about? Tell me you know, tell me about that. What are you thinking? <laughs> what made you say that? Why are we talking about it? To actually take a stop and listen to what your child is saying, because sometimes they ask little things that we want to quickly reassure them. Oh, no, don't worry. But really, there's a deeper, we can really draw it out if we talk to them. And one thing that you could say is, that's a really interesting question. Tell me what. Tell me why you're asking, or what more about that do you want to know? Because oftentimes kids are just looking for an opening, right, mm -hmm. to be able to talk about how they're feeling. But parents may not be in the right frame of mind to give child space to talk about that. Um, also, a, another big sign is if kids are suddenly having a lot of physical pains, like headaches or stomach aches or um, you know, just kind of vague complaints that you're not sure what it's about, you can say, you know, that your stomach is hurting again. I wonder what's, you know, how's your stomach feeling? Like, what is it, what's that trying to um, tell us? Right. And just get kids to be curious about their own situations and the feelings. I know that one of the things that as I was leaving pediatrics was the amount of those kind of problems that we were seeing with all the vaccines and everything, we didn't see as many physical problems. I'd say almost one out of five kids by the time I was leaving pediatrics, it wasn't that long ago, was psychological, chronic stomach aches, headaches, aches and pains, sleeping disorders, things like that. That you said their normal routine is disrupted and the parents have brought them in three or four times convinced that we're not finding this physical ailment when what it really is, when you understand what that child's life is like it's stress and so another I go back to that family we talked about the parents are working they're they're taking their kids they're trying to get their kids in sport reassess this is a time to reassess what's really important in life you may be causing the stress <laughs> <laughs> you may be actually making things worse by thinking well I'm taking them to this and I'm doing this because I want them to have this you're wanting them to have that experience when they really don't want that mm -hmm. and sometimes that stress is something that you have to Take a look in the mirror, if I may say. Well, and take the barometer of your own family stress. Like, um, how calm and relaxed and peaceful is our household? Um, who is kind of fraying at the edges, and what does that look like? 
Um, is it dinner time? Is it bedtime? Is it like where are our difficult moments as a family and what can we do to make those moments a little bit more calm right. and relaxed? Um, if we're getting into trouble because we're um, trying to hurry our kids through their routine, then you might find that there's this um, these stressful interactions that just make life so difficult. Well, and I want to take a little jump from the childhood to the grandparent because being a grandparent now, I can see there's this symbiosis of what grandparents offer to kids, that kind of loving, unconditional, steady kind of love that they're not in the they're not in the thick of things, so they can't say like the parents, and they're not trying to impress their parents in the same ways that they're trying to do with their grandparents. They're just loving their grandparents. Their grandparents play with them. They have fun with them. And now that's, that connection is often lost as well. So it may be an opportunity for the grandparent to reactivate somehow. Yes, he misses you, but you miss him too. And let's see how we can, what can we do? What kind of connection can we have? Can we have a book? Can we write? Can we send little pen pick you be my new pen pal or something like that and send that connection mm -hmm. because kids are sponges right and so they want to soak up all of the love and compassion and the generosity of the adults around them so I think it is really important to activate all sources of support for the family you know when the the nuclear family is struggling grandparents, aunts and uncles, uh, neighbors can really be sources of support and yet in our culture it's kind of like the parents and the kids are alone together um, and that is um, sometimes isolating for those families and so drawing on that support is really important. Um, since a lot of the questions came from school and we talked about like warning signs, I would imagine schoolwork decreasing in school, less interest in schoolwork, less interest in school friends may also be a warning sign? Absolutely. Um, just kind of a, a decreased uh, motivation or effort or energy with school, um, kind of withdrawing from friends or um, activities that they like to do. Um, oftentimes it's even like short-tempered um, kind of quick to be irritable or angry, um, those are all signs for, uh, well, younger children as well as older children that they might um, just need some additional support. Mm -hmm. And I would think also that one of the things that I would think since they're spending more time at home, food becomes an issue um, with them, eating too much or eating the wrong things or changing their diet, because that could be a warning sign too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, weight loss or weight gain, um, eating too little or too much, or just being kind of outside the routine, right? I mean, families need routine more than anyone else. And just kind of knowing that um, here's the time we get up, here's the time we eat, um, this is what a normal routine looks like for our family is so important for kids. Well, and I also see again, going back to my pediatric days, some parents are just obsessed about food and weight gain. And so they make the kids almost like hoarders. And so I would say one of the things is hoarding of food is a sign that there's some stress going on as well. Yeah, or sometimes um, you'll see kids doing anxiety rituals, not just hoarding, but you know, checking that the door is locked all the time or um, always having to look under the bed for the monsters. You know, um, some of those things are normal and natural, but when, when your child looks like they're, um, really need those things or are they, they have difficulty being reassured um, that that might be a sign that they're really struggling. Which sort of gets us into now how do we help when a child is struggling and I think one of the things that I just want to start with that I recognize is we don't realize what kids hear and see. So if you're watching news for three hours a day and all they hear is terrible things and people and they see examples of people dying of COVID the kids are getting a much different perception and yet we don't think they're watching because we're watching and they don't think they're hearing because they're in their room or they're somewhere else. So the first thing I say, be careful as a parent how you approach things, what you watch and what you do. Mm -hmm. and, and be intentional about what you're talking about and 
yeah, that, that person is sick and in the hospital and we're gonna pray for them, but the doctors and nurses are doing all that they can to help. Um, you really wanna direct your kid's attention to all of the people in this situation that are loving and caring and compassionate and helping one another. Um, and, and I think that that is, again, kids take their emotional cues from their parents. And so that is really important. And, and just to say, this is a hard time, but we're all going to do our best to get through this. And I think, you know, one of the things that constantly is addressed is being safe, feeling safe. And where kids, again, we talked about, they feel that, well, if that happened to that person, is it gonna happen to you, mom? Or is it gonna happen to you, dad? Or is it gonna happen to my brother? Or is it gonna happen to my sister? Or is it gonna happen to me? And so there's the kinds of things and that kind of, like you said, that direct conversation about keeping people safe, but not making people paranoid. There's a fine line <laughs> between saying, you can't touch that because you might get this, and you can't touch that, and things like that. And kids are touchers, and they're huggers, and they're moving around. And so tell me a little bit more, talk a little bit more, how do we keep that sort of balance? How do we keep kids balanced and feeling safe? I think that you can't, kids can see right through you. So if you say, oh, mom's never gonna get sick, that's not gonna happen. Um, that's not the truth <laughs> because I may get sick yep. and that might happen. Um, so all you can say is, um, honey, we don't know what the future holds. We're gonna try our best to be safe, but if I get sick, we will deal with that. And there are doctors and nurses that would be able to help me and even then you will be loved and cared for. So I think helping children understand that even in the worst case, everything will be okay. And that even if it's not, we'll get through it together is the most important message. And that relies on our faith. Mm -hmm. And we have to believe that we can handle difficult things and we can survive them and that we'll emerge from the other side relatively okay. And that takes us into talking about faith. And faith is a really interesting topic when we talk about kids. Because I think this is a really nice opportunity to talk about our faith as community, the communion of saints. I saw kids on Sunday that for St. Nick's Day, they got these little saints made out of wood. They each got a different saint that they can pray to. Having that tangible little things are really important. And this might be a good time for parents to sort of explore not the tenets of our faith that Jesus died on the cross but here we have a community of saints we have a community of communion of people that are out there with us there's people in heaven there are people on earth so yeah grandpa is up there he's still with us he's and we still pray for him and with him mm -hmm. so tell me your experience or what how would you like, how would you sort of talk to parents about using their faith with their children in these circumstances? I think that the most important message is that um, God loves us and that no matter what happens to us on earth, there is a heaven that we are just waiting for the joy and the peace that's there. And so when family members or people that we know have died, we talk about it's hard because we miss that person and we wish they were with us, but they are filled with joy and they're having conversations with God every day to help us. Um, they're looking down from heaven and, and they're just so proud of you when you go to school and you, you do great on a test or something. So really planting that image um, for kids that there is a whole spiritual reality that our earthly experience is just one glimmer of, um, I think helps um, my daughter has been asking questions about like are there animals in heaven you know she loves animals and I think yeah I think God does have animals in heaven and, and what do you think God how do you think God cares for them in heaven and it really is a way of accessing her spirituality from something that she deeply cares about and is asking about I know one of the children's masses recently one of the homilies or I should say the reading was Jesus thanking God for making the kingdom of God open to the childlike. And it's as I looked out at the kids, my first comment in my homily was, you guys are here to teach us about the kingdom of God. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. He's telling us, we're trying to be sophisticated and tell you all these things and have, 
we should look at you and see how you are. So it's interesting that we also can learn from the child. And they often, when we plant that seed, like you said, we give them that little seed about being direct, but giving comforting and giving them safe, they'll come up with things that we will re be remarkable to us okay. about it. And we'll say, hey, that's a great idea. Or, boy, you know, you didn't think you heard me when I talked about this. So I think that's an important part is that the, our faith is supposed to be childlike. It's supposed to be that simple as, I want to see my animals in heaven. Well, that's a good thing. Let's talk about that. Yeah. And let's see what that's like. I remember the day that my daughter, we came into church and there was a cicada on the ground in the portico. Um, and so after church, she had to run right there and Father Aaron w had the mass and he was standing out in the front, like almost standing in that same spot. And so she's like, you know, running toward him. I think he was thinking she, he was running towards him, but she was like, move away because the cicada, cicada was under his feet. So we had to explain to Father Aaron, we spent the whole mass worrying about this cicada and was it going to be okay? But that's an example of um, helping your child be um, drawn into compassion and love and spirituality. So if she spent the whole mass worried about the cicada, I think that that was an okay experience. And I do, and I think as parents, one of the things I would say is this is an opportunity for you to get spiritually connected to God through that experiences with your kids to see. So I think that this, again, you're helping, I always, I always say when the when you're teaching a child, they're also teaching you. And this is the same sort of circumstances. When you say, how can I help my child? How is my child helping me? Should be the other end of that question for what I'm doing. So keeping that positive attitude and understanding that they're helping you and you're helping them is something that I think is really, like you said, they, they're so perceptive of what you're doing. And if parents just remember that single thing, that they're so perceptive so they see what you're really feeling and doing, so make it good. <laughs> and I was reading a reflection the other day where it was like the parent was saying, oh, the, the child is going to be traumatized and this was such a dark time for all of us. And then kind of 10 years later says to the child, do you remember that pandemic? And then the child says back, yes. We pl I remember we played games as a family and we slowed down and and we did these kind of things, you know, art things or creative things, and that was a happy time for me. <laughs> exactly. And and so you so know. kids really read that emotional experience in such different ways than adults do. And exactly. And you know, we talked at the beginning. What about those parents that are working doing? A, my question, I hate to say it, is, are you doing what you need to do in life? I, and it may come down. You know, sometimes these kinds of situations really ask very deep questions of what's important in our life. Do you really need to be doing what you're doing? It's not a matter of adding something more to your plate, it's a matter of subtracting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes reassessing, like you said, one of the things that might come out of this whole pandemic is how we look at what's our priorities, what mattered. And from your reflection, it's too bad that what mattered was to the child was that we played games and we had a good time together. And it's very going to be interesting with that. So looking at that, I think it's going to be important as well. I'm good with everything. Thank you very much. You joined us. We taught a lot of talking. We, we broke this up. We kind of talked continuously where we broke this up into three sessions. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. And I hope that everyone listening has gotten something from this. That's my hope and prayer. Um, but if you have additional questions or feedback, please let us know. We'd love to hear. Right, and if you want to hear more or you want to do something in a different format, we'll, we'll decide and we'll talk about that. But thanks for the Holy Spirit calling you to us. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. inviting me. Thank you for joining us.